Welcome to this presentation. Today we're going to discuss um, how our course is organized for the semester. Um, I apologize in advance, this isn't going to be the most scintillating of the lectures that you'll be uh, watching over the course of the semester, um, but it does include uh, important information that I think will position you well for success in this course. A couple of pieces of advice. Um, Please don't feel like you have to watch this in one setting. In fact, I encourage you to maybe watch for 10 minutes, take a break, do something else, and then come back to it, or you know, every 15 or 20 minutes or something along those lines. Second thing I suggest that you do is take careful notes. Now, that way you won't have to re-watch the video to find out, now, what did Groover say about this or what did Groover say about that? I think that can be a very useful way to spend your time. The orientation PowerPoint that I'm about to cover is available to you, so things that you see on the PowerPoint you don't need to write down, but you know you'll, you'll want to remember where you can find that information. So if you haven't already gathered together your note-taking equipment, uh, you may want to pause me now and gather those items together. Okay, well let's begin. Um, before we go into the PowerPoint, I'm going to back up for a second and go to our course. When you enter our Canvas course, this should be pretty much what you see. You won't have this fuchsia border at the bottom, but otherwise it should look very similar. In this course, you're going to spend the vast majority of your time on the button Home. You'll also spend some time with announcements because I do send out typically one or two announcements a week. Typically those announcements will be waiting for you Monday morning. Um, every now and again I may be a little delayed, but that's generally where uh, you'll see the announcements. We'll talk more about those later. And then of course everyone's interested in their grades and you'll be able to find those available here. A few pieces of information before we go farther about grades are that a Canvas is a very robust and neat learning management system. I'm a big fan of it. But um, just like any system, it's not perfect. And so a Canvas lacks some of the technical things that are necessary to accurately calculate your grade in this course. Canvas can give you an approximation. Uh, but if, let's say, you're sitting at a 79, well, you might have a 79 or you might have an 80 um, when I actually crunch the numbers. Um, usually Canvas is going to understate your grades, but it's mathematically possible that Canvas might overstate your grades. So please take the calculations that Canvas does on your grades with a grain of salt. They're going to give you a guesstimate of where you are. If you have a 75 in the course, you're probably pretty good with, with being in a C range. If you have a 96 in the course, you're solid for an A. But if you're close to a boundary, you'll want to think to yourself, I might be the higher grade or I might be the lower grade. Now, if you really want to sit down and crunch the numbers, I'll show you a little bit of information about how to do that. But I always ask that you take what Canvas says with a grain of salt. This semester, I've chosen to allow Canvas to calculate the grades, at least as an estimation. In the past, I haven't done that, and some students have gotten frustrated, and understandably so, because even though Canvas isn't perfect, they at least give a rough estimate. Um, but I don't want you to take it too seriously. I don't want you to think, oh my gosh, um, I definitely need to get a few more points to get that B or that A or whatever it is that you're seeking for. Uh, may be true, may not be true. Okay, so let's get started with uh, the materials. And you see here the first item that we have is, is called Start Here Orientation. And you can see there are several items in this first module. And once you, we're done with the first module, there is, an, so here's where the first module begins with the words Start Here Orientation. We scroll down a little bit and you'll see it ends with Assignment Grade Worksheet. Going a little farther, we have something called McGraw-Hill Connect Information. So these are the, the two modules here that kind of get you started in the course. From this point on, we're actually getting into the nitty gritty, what the course is actually about. So you'll see the, this next module is called Module 1. A little misleading since it's actually the third module. But what I mean is it's the first substantive module. And you'll see after module one, you'll have module two. Okay, no big surprise there. But then we have module 2A. Um, 
uh, chapters two and six are very much related to each other. And so um, I choose to call them module two and module two A. Um, so as a result, our next module is module three, although it's the fourth module um, that is substantive at this point, and it's actually the sixth module that we have going down. So it's a little bit misleading uh, from that perspective. Um, you'll notice that the module number does not track with the chapter number. Uh, so module four isn't about chapter four. We don't, actually don't cover chapter four in this course. So you can think about it as being module four, you can think about it as, as it being chapter five, whatever makes more sense to you. We're continuing on, we're up to module five. You will probably notice here that, oh, wait a second, the chapters really aren't coming in order. Um, there's, we roughly or loosely follow the order of the textbook, but there are some chapters that we take in a different order. Um, I'll explain later on why we do them in the order that we do them in. And now we're to chapter 24. Now our chapter 25, and now we're gonna jump back to chapter seven. But let's look here for a second. This is module seven, and this is module eight. But we'll see that we actually do these two um, chapters together, these modules together. So you shouldn't assume that this means module eight means week eight. Um, sometimes two modules will happen in one week, sometimes we'll just do one module. And module nine. Module nine is our last module before um, the midterm. And so everything from module nine and before will be on the midterm examination. After module nine, we of course go to module 10, and this is where the contracts content begins. And so the rest of the course is all about contract law. So we go chapter nine, uh, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. And that's our last chapter in the course. And then there's material for helping you prepare for tests, including the midterm, even though we have the midterm offered earlier, and the final examination. And then here's more specific information about the final examination. And then here's some cases um, that are relevant to some of the chapters that we cover. And there are some web links uh, down here, uh, good legal resources if you have an interest in exploring these topics in more detail. Finally, if you're thinking about law school, I encourage you to come by and talk with me. I'd be glad to, to discuss with you uh, strategies to get into law school, um, things to think about as you are preparing for that journey, if that is what you're thinking about. And maybe you you aren't sure that you want to go to law school. I don't get a commission by persuading people to go to law school. Um, I'll, I'll be candid with you about the advantages and disadvantages of this career path. Um, I love the law, uh, but I realize it's not the right path for everybody. Let me just scroll up here and show you one more item. That is after item for the chapter nine, I said that the midterm will be between chapters eight and chapter nine. That's not actually completely true. Um, because the midterm is going to happen, uh, actually I'm going to pull up this a little bit here, the midterm is going to happen um, in this area between here, um, between chapter, I guess I probably should, should move, move the midterm up a little bit closer, um, so it's, I can't change it while I'm on student view, let me leave student view for a second, um, so that's actually where it, where it should be, so I'm going to move the midterm so it is between chapters eight and chapters nine. Now you'll see that the midterm is a little bit on the late side. It's a little bit beyond the halfway point. Uh, the reason for that is that um, about mm, maybe 40% of the course is contract law. Contract law is by far the most important part of business law for business professionals. Um, and so I wanna keep all the contract law together. But before we get to contract law, we need to have some kind of organizing principles in effect. And so once I have those first initial chapters, and then, then if we were to do contract law, then we'd be well beyond the halfway point of the course. <clears throat> and so what I've decided to do is do the introductory materials 
then do everything that isn't contract law and have our midterm a little bit on the late side and then conclude with contract law. That's just my method of setting it up. There's lots of other ways that would be equally good, but you got to pick some way. So that's um, how I go about doing it. So after we're done with module nine, we'll have the midterm examination and go on to module 10. Okay, so let me go back to student view and let's go through the PowerPoint. Let me first of all begin, if I haven't already done so, and welcome you to uh, uh, business law. Business law is a ton of fun. Uh, this is, in, in my humble opinion, one of the most interesting topics um, that many uh, uh, that is available at the community college level. It it kind of the intersection of lots of different aspects of life. It has the business side, but it also has the human element. We're talking about how real people function in the real world. And real people are not always predictable or rational. Uh, sometimes they do silly and crazy things. And we'll be talking about some of those things. And we'll be talking also a little bit about philosophy. Uh, not philosophy perhaps in the rigorous sense of a discipline that you might study in the a humanities area, but in the sense of how are we going to organize our world? What values do we put a high regard on? Uh, because all of those issues play out when we talk about the law and the things that we're trying to accomplish through our legal system. And so there's just lots of differing, uh, different ideas that we're going to be confronting in this course. So even if you have no interest in going to law school, or working in the legal profession, uh, feel, uh, feel confident that it's not going to be that kind of a boring uh, presentation. We're going to talk about practical things for business people to know. We're not going to get into the weeds. We're not going to learn all the stuff that you need to know if you go into law school. That's a much, much deeper dive than we have time for, frankly, in this course, and that would be of interest and, and of utility to most uh, future business people. So we're going to focus on, I hope, the most interesting parts and the parts that are going to be most useful for you. Of course, if you have questions, please feel free to come and see me. I would love to meet all of you over the course of the semester. Um, I know being on an online course and this is more challenging to, to get to know the instructor on a personal level. I hope that you won't let that be an impediment for you um, because you'll be listening to my lectures every week. In some sense, you'll get to know me a little bit, but um, I will only get to know you through your um, discussion board posts. And I would really like to get to know all of the students in the class on a more personal level. So please, please, please stop by and see me. I would love to get to know you and learn more about what your goals are and how I can add value um, to that, that uh, career path that you're thinking about. Here I am. So if you see me on, on the campus, you'll know, oh yeah, that's Gruber. Okay. Um, I have been practicing law for many, many years. I graduated from law school in 1990 and I went to work for a large law firm in Houston. I worked there for a few years and then I went in-house. The term in-house in the law means I went to work for a corporation and I worked for JCPenney here in Plano uh, for um, about 17 years. And then in 2010, I decided to become a full-time faculty member at college. Colin. Um, it was, uh, it's been a lot of fun over like, these years of having the opportunity to uh, be involved in the teaching profession. I'm very glad that I've had this opportunity. When I was actively practicing law, my area was labor and employment law, but I also did some litigation and even just a touch of criminal work. So um, there will be several parts of the course that I have uh, some direct experience in, but there will be other parts that my knowledge is a little bit more theoretical. Um, I, as I said before, I've been at Colin for a little over eight years now. Um, I am what's called the discipline lead for the paralegal program. You may be wondering, what is a paralegal? A paralegal is kind of the equivalent of a nurse. Uh, what a nurse does say in the um, medical profession, a paralegal does in the legal profession. There's a lot of differences too. I don't want to draw that analogy too far. But basically, a paralegal assists an attorney in the provision of legal services. A paralegal in Texas doesn't need to be licensed, so um, there isn't any particular test that a paralegal must pass. But um, in order to uh, be uh, a high wage earner in this particular industry, uh, you will need 
need to have um, experience and the credentials that a community college program would be able to provide. Uh, paralegalism is a smart choice for individuals who aren't sure whether they want to go to law school, uh, but do know that they are interested in the legal profession and that going to a Collins paralegal program is a lot less expensive, of course, than going to law school. Um, and even if you do decide that you want to go to law school, your paralegal experience can help pay for law school, number one, and number two, many of the skills that you develop as a paralegal are directly relevant to the skills that you'll need as an attorney. Uh, but most paralegals do not plan on becoming attorneys, um, either because they aren't interested in uh, pursuing a career that is uh, significantly more stress and also involves a significantly larger time commitment both in terms of getting the credentials that you need as well as the number of hours that you need to work in that profession. Uh, so there's uh, advantages and disadvantages to being an, becoming an attorney versus becoming a paralegal. Um, I'll be glad to talk to you at great length about both of those uh, career paths if you are interested. But of course, this isn't a course in the paralegal program, so I won't be focusing on that for most of the presentations that we have. Instead, I will be focusing on business law. But not only do I teach in the paralegal program and I teach business law, I also teach hospitality law, uh, which is uh, basically business law for the hospitality industry. And I finally teach employment practices. I teach an employment law course within the paralegal program, but I um, teach employment practices to business professionals who are interested in um, HR. And this is the employment law course for HR professionals. So if you're thinking about that type of a business career, I hope that you'll consider taking employment practices. Let me give you the information about that particular course. It's I call it Harpo. Oh, let's see. I'm sure why that's not working. Here we go. Let's see if we can. Ah, here we go. Harpo H R P O twenty three oh three. And this is an online course as well. We'll have one chapter on employment law in, in this course. We'll just kind of uh, brush the topic very, very lightly on top, kind of. Um, and then we'll, in this course, we do a, a pretty deep dive into many of the issues that are relevant to HR professionals or, honestly, anyone who is in the business area. Um, so let's go forward from here. My office is on the Preston Ridge or the Frisco campus. My office actually is in the library building on the second floor. My office faces the quad. Um, I've got a pretty cool office, so hopefully you'll be able to come by and we'll be able to meet. Um, I am delighted to provide guidance on, obviously, the course material that we're covering in this course, but also you may have questions about professional goals and may want to uh, learn more about various disciplines. My expertise is in the area of the law and HR, but I have some knowledge about other uh, disciplines, and so I'd be glad uh, to give you my thoughts and also to help with resumes. Um, one thing that attorneys are good at is writing, and so I can would be delighted to assist in uh, you uh, creating that document that's going to get you that next awesome job. You'll find the information about when my office hours are on the syllabus, which I'll be covering later on, so I'm going to save this one for a little bit later. Okay, so we have a tool. We actually have two tools. Well, more than two tools. We've got several tools in this course. One is the textbook. You may have already bit, bought it. Um, the, the place to buy the textbook is in the Collin Bookstore. You'll want to buy it there for several reasons. The most important reason is that that's by far the cheapest way of getting the stuff you need for this course. Uh, that's the first thing. The second reason is that it's just super convenient. Um, so either whichever one of those are most important, that this is the, the right place for you to go. Um, if you have bought the book somewhere else, uh, uh, you you may um, you. you it's still probably okay that, that we can proceed with, with that purchase, um, but you will need for sure the Connect tool. Um, we'll, we'll talk later on. This is the about half of your grade are the materials that you're going to do in Connect. Now, if you buy the textbook from our bookstore, you'll and it's a new version of the textbook, you'll automatically have this. It's included in the price of your textbook. If you buy the textbook elsewhere and, and it doesn't have a Connect code in it, you'll have to buy the Connect code separately. Um, 
which is fine. I, I don't have a particular reason to prefer one approach or the other. It's just much more expensive for you to buy these separately. The textbook code plus the, excuse me, the textbook plus the connect code at Collins Bookstore is actually cheaper than buying the connect code on its own. So let's say you bought the textbook elsewhere. It didn't come with the connect code. You're trying to figure out, well, how do I get the connect? Your best strategy is probably still going to be to go to the Collins Bookstore um, and buy the the connect code. You'll also, of course, get another copy of the textbook. You won't need that, but you know it won't hurt you to have another copy of the textbook. We actually have what's called a custom edition of the textbook. Um, the actual textbook, if you were to go to say Amazon or Chegg or the textbook or McGraw Hill, the textbook publisher, is quite a bit thicker book. The intention of the textbook is for it to be a year-long course. Well, guess what? We're just taking it for a semester, so obviously we can only cover about half of the material, and uh, that's about how much of the big textbook is in our custom textbook. We only have about half of those. And of course, we've selected the chapters that are relevant to us. So you won't see for in your version of the textbook, you won't have, for example, chapter 15 or chapter 16 or chapter 17. Perfectly good chapters. If we were taking a second semester, those would probably be taught chapters that we cover. All of the chapters that you will need for this course, you'll find in the Colin Custom Textbook, except for chapter two. Chapter two is not in the paper printed custom textbook, but that's okay because you still have access to it through Connect. Connect is an elect includes, in addition to all of the uh, quizzing and other tools it has, also includes an electronic version of the textbook. I always like to flag that because some of the students are struggling to find that chapter two in, in their paper textbook and they become concerned, oh, I got a bad copy of it, what's going on here that's not there. It just isn't in there. Um, there's always a negotiation between faculty to decide which textbooks would go, which chapters would go in and uh, chapter two just didn't make the cut, but I still um, require it for this class. So that's the one chapter that you will need to go to connect for. It's a real short chapter, so um, I don't think it will be a major issue for you to um, access it through the connect tool. So once you get your textbook from the Colin Bookstore, you'll see in the back cover information about how to get on Connect. Um, that's one of the reasons you want to buy a new version of the textbook, by the way, because of course if you buy an old one, it may be that that Connect code has already been used. That's also possible it hasn't been used because many instructors don't use the Connect tool. So you could play a little bit of a game of, of uh, I guess Russian roulette, so to speak, and um, buy a used version of the textbook and hope that that connect code in the book is still good. And more likely than not, it probably will be. So that's a judgment call for you to make. Uh, but the, the absolute certain path is to buy a new one that's sealed from the bookstore, and then you'll definitely have the connect code available for you. Okay. Um, and here's more information about um, the. Uh, uh, connect uh, information. This is the actual name of the textbook. The author is Kubasek, or the main author. There's actually several authors. One other thing I'd like to share with you, let's say you're taking this course and you're not 100% sure you're going to stick with it. You're very busy, lots of things are going on, and you'd hate to buy um, the, the connect tool, for example, because you're just not sure if you're going to continue. Um, our textbook is not expensive in this course compared to textbooks generally, but certainly textbooks are not an inexpensive tool generally speaking. So I understand and can relate to your concern about that. You can try out connect for a free, I think, 14 day period to see if you want to continue in the course. Now, as I said before, if you choose not to continue in the course, uh, or you choose not to continue connect, you do need to drop the course because you just can't be successful in this course. There are other instructors who don't use connect. They have face-to-face -face classes. And so um, if you're thinking to yourself, oh gosh, I, I, I found a cheap version of this textbook. Um, I don't want to have to go buy connect separately. I just want to switch to a different instructor section. Uh, please act quickly. There's lots of great instructors that teach this face-to-face, -face, both in the daytime and the evening. 
on the Plano campus and on the Frisco campus. And so um, it may make sense for you to switch to one of their classes in that they are, they are not going to require Connect, but you do need to act really, really quickly. I try to run my online classroom like I try to run my classes. Um, I have lectures. Uh, everything that I would have said in class, you will have the opportunity to hear on the on, uh, taped lectures. You won't see my smiling face, but you will see my PowerPoints. And so yeah, I try to replicate the experience as much as possible. Obviously, you can't interrupt and say, oh, you know what, I have this question or I have this comment to make. And that's a downside to having taped lectures, but there are lots of upsides. One thing is that you can watch me or watch the video whenever you want to, um, you know, to a in the morning uh, when you're dashing between one meeting to another meeting you can watch me in little bursts 10 minutes here 30 minutes there whatever makes sense for you you can watch me in your jammies you can watch me while you're eating dinner whatever makes sense for you you can watch me more than once you can fast forward through me whatever makes sense for you it gives you a lot of flexibility but it's not entirely the same as the online course but I try to make it as close as possible Sometimes students think, well, the lectures must be kind of optional because this is an online course. Um, I don't see it that way. I write the tests. And so what I talk about in class is really what's going to be on the test. Um, for the most part, what I talk about in class is available in the textbook. There are a small amount of information. It's probably less than probably 5% or so that I cover in class through the tape lectures that are going to be on the test but are not available in the textbook. Oftentimes those are Texas specific answers to, to legal questions. Uh, so if you never ever watch a lecture and you really, really know the textbook, can you do fine in the course? Absolutely. But you're just making it harder for yourself because I tell you what you need to know for the class. So if you have a choice between reading the textbook and watching my lectures, and I hope you don't have that choice, I hope you do both, please watch my lectures. That's going to give you the most bang for your buck in terms of your grade and for your preparation for tests. Having said that, you want to do both. That's your real uh, method to be successful in the course. If you haven't already, please go ahead and browse Canvas. Every instructor sets up his or her course a little bit differently. And so getting familiar with uh, where the furniture is, you know, where the doorknobs are, where the light switches are, where the electrical outlets are, so to speak, um, is a really important part of becoming familiar uh, with the course and becoming comfortable in the course. And so I encourage you to do that. Maybe set aside 20 or 30 minutes to explore as early on so that you'll have that level of comfort and knowledge going forward. Forward. Play particular attention, of course, to the orientation content. Um, I label it start here. Um, you won't be as successful in the course if you don't spend time here. There's lots of, I don't want to say traps because I'm not doing them on purpose, but at the end of the semester, there will be students who come to me and say, but I didn't understand that I had to do this, or if you had, I, I, but I don't remember you saying this in the orientation lecture, or whatever it is. And so sometimes I have to convey some not so happy news to folks, and I hate doing it, and I know they don't enjoy hearing it. And I think to myself every time, gosh, I just wish this person had maybe spent an extra 30 minutes watching that orientation lecture or something like that. I don't want you to be that person. I don't want anybody to be that person. And so my suggestion is to go ahead Ahead and spend you know an hour or two going over these materials so that you can truly truly be successful in the course if you don't have experience with canvas um, there there we have so many awesome awesome tools to get you comfortable with it please go ahead and explore those tools if you haven't done so already um, if you get a room of faculty, a, a faculty together in a room and you were to say, what's the one piece of advice that students ought to take seriously? Um, I would say probably 70 or 80% of, of the faculty will say, read your syllabus. That's so important. And faculty members don't say that, I don't think, because uh, they're so proud of their syllabi, because actually syllabi are pretty boring to read, because that's why people don't read them, right? Um, but they, it really is the key to being successful in a course. I'll give you an example. We'll talk about how grades are calculated in a few minutes. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with students over a single question on an online quiz or a single question on an assignment. 
and they feel that they should have gotten it right and they got it marked wrong or whatever. And I start by saying, we can talk about this and maybe you're even right, but it has zero impact upon your grades. There is no mathematical chance that if you got points for this, it's going to change your grade one letter up or one letter down. And the reason that they fix it on this is that they haven't internalized what matters from a grade perspective in this course. And you get that information on the syllabus. And so when you know where to invest your effort, you are going to reap significant dividends. There are some things in this course that have very, very low point values. And there are some things that have very, very high point values. And you'll want to obviously focus your efforts on those things with higher uh, point values. That's just common sense. So use the syllabus as a tool for your success. Um, I ask that you visit the class at least twice. Uh, and when I say visit the class, I mean go to Canvas at least twice a week and try to come by by at least Tuesday. I think about the class as starting on Monday and ending on Sunday. Uh, most students will. Uh, aim to spend time in the class on Saturdays and Sundays and that's fine I completely understand that just be sure that you're doing one visit on Monday and Tuesday that's a good time by the way to do your first post in the discussion board you want to check your announcements when you're there every time announcements by the way actually go to your Cougar mail address and they also will appear on canvas I'll show you where you'll find those in a few minutes um, many students choose not to use their Cougar mail that often perfectly fine no problem there but if you're not checking it you're missing out on those announcements as I said earlier I send at least one announcement a week usually early on Monday morning and so uh, it's information that's going to set you up for success if you don't have it you're going to be uh, lacking some information that could have made a difference in you being more more able to be successful on a particular tool so be sure to look at those you will need to make two discussion posts for each discussion board that you participate in. We'll talk more about that later. When you make your first post, which is your sub, well, I call it your substantive post, but it could be your um, your first post, whatever, however you want to reflect refer to that you need to make it by noon on Saturday I have that rule because everybody needs to make their main post and then a reply post but I used to have it be so that uh, people didn't even start making posts until like 8 p.m. on Sunday night and so the few people who might have um, made their post earlier maybe they were away for the weekend really couldn't make a reply post because there wasn't a, a first post for them to reply to um, so I ask ideally that you make that first post on that Monday or Tuesday of your first visit and I really ask if you can at all to do it before the weekend but um, noon on Saturday is the last time that you can make uh, your substantive post for points you can make it after then but it's not it, you're, you're gonna have a deduction in points uh, for the delay I don't accept late homework submissions we'll see later on that that's not really too much of an issue in this course other than on the discussion board the discussion board closes at 11:59 p.m. on Sunday and so at you know midnight you won't be able to receive points for that I don't like to spend a lot of time talking about deadlines they're all available to you on canvas you're an adult I'm an adult honestly it's kind of insulting for me to go around saying hey by the way have you brushed your teeth did you remember to floss um, I do that with my kids because they're not adults so I'm not going to patronize you by engaging in those behaviors um, they're they're available to you on canvas canvas has lots of good tools to uh, get those dates um, and one thing you may want to do now you may want to pause and get out your day planner and write in those dates if you'd like but you'll see that the discussion boards will open on early Monday morning and will close um, at 11 59 p.m. on Sunday and we'll talk about other due dates in a bit crises happen right I mean things you can't deal in a world where you're relying upon computers and not know at some point over the course of the semester some system is going to be down it might be canvas it might be the connect tool 
it might be your Wi-Fi, it might be your computer, or some combination of those. And sometimes we'll never really know what happened. Um, the neat thing about how I've designed the course is that lots of things can go wrong and you still will be absolutely fine. We'll talk more about those later on. Because I've built in a lot of those uh, fixers or fail safes, um, I'm not very sympathetic. I am sympathetic. I, I completely get it on a human level, but I'm not sympathetic from a great perspective in giving more time or making exceptions. Um, that you will have had so many opportunities to, to get things right that, um, again, it, it falls into the area of not treating you like an adult by saying, okay, you know, uh, it's the type of thing you would expect to do for a 12 year old or a 14 year old, and I'm not going to um, put you in a position where, where I'm treating you like you aren't an adult because that's not cool for either one of us. Um, please contact me. Uh, one of the best ways to contact me is by email. We'll talk more about that later. But I'm also available by phone. Um, uh, I will have office hours, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And of course, come by and see me face to face. That also works. Let's talk about emails. Um, you will discover, you know, if you've... I remember vaguely being a student at once, and I remember you would, we would talk about our instructors, and it seemed like most instructors had some kind of quirk um, about this or that thing, and I'm sure you've already identified some of your instructors. This instructor, if you're eating food, he gets mad. This instructor, if you get out your cell phone, she gets mad. Um, or this instructor, you know, whatever the things are. Everybody has their little quirks or little things. So I suppose if you're talking with your friends about me, probably what you'll say is, Groover's generally okay, but she's got this weird quirk about emails. Um, so I'm just preparing you for it. Um, my justification for my email thing is that I want you to be successful professionally. And in my life, both pre-Colin and while I have been at Colin, is that uh, people who don't know how to write emails don't see their careers progress very far. It is one of those life skills that no one seems to want to teach stu students or young professionals. And yet you have to, have to, have to know that to be impressive to other people. So much of the, the communication that we have in the business world is via email. And um, uh, in my professional life at, at JCPenney, there are lots of people that I had very long involved relationships with that I would not recognize if I were to see them on the street because most of our communications were via email or telephone. And my impressions of them are based upon how they write emails for the most part. And some of them I think well of and think they're smart, capable, successful business people. And some of them I think, you know, you need to have somebody, you know, uh, feed you. <laughs> if, if, that, if that's how you write an email, clearly you need major, major help. Don't be that person. And the way you, 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 you aren't that person is by learning how to write emails. And so I like to add that little value at it. Uh, the, the law that we learn in this course is, is important to your career, but I would say to you, if you don't learn any law, but you move from not knowing how to write a professional email to knowing how to write a professional email in this course, that's a huge win for you and your career. Okay, so let's get started talking about email stuff. We already talked about the fact you do need to check for those announcements um, over the course of the semester, um, every week at least, and, and not a bad idea to check more than once a week, especially when we're getting close to finals and midterms. Um, when you're corresponding with me, use this email. You can see it's my first initial, Groover. By the way, Groover is a weird name. I apologize, it's my husband's fault. Um, it has a V in it. It's not a B as in Bobby. It's a V as in Victor at colin.edu. Let me pause here and show you how Canvas looks because this is something that is, it's just a problem. I'm not going to lie to you. Look over here. There's this thing called Inbox. It is so tempting to click on that. If you wanted to communicate with me, I mean, why wouldn't you hit this box? Then you could send me an email. I mean, it, could, it couldn't be easier. It seems so intuitive. You may also find that other instructors that you have here at Colin love this inbox. So you may be used to using it. I understand that. I don't blame those other instructors and I certainly don't blame you. 
but I don't use this. And unfortunately, I can't make this box go away. So if you send me an email to this box, I'm probably not going to see it because I don't check it. I use my email. The reason I use my email is primarily because I teach paralegal courses and most of my students are repeat students. I may have a single student, you know, for five or six courses. And I want to have all of my correspondence with that student in one place. And my email affords me the ability to sort it and put it in various folders and allows me to manipulate it in ways that this inbox just doesn't let me do. So I don't use this. If you send me an email here, it's like it never happened. So please don't uh, disadvantage yourself by doing that. Go ahead and send me an email to this address. Um, when you are corresponding with me, please use your Cougar Mail email address, not your personal email address. I know it's a hassle. You don't use your Cougar Mail maybe that often. If you want to keep a record of our correspondence in your personal email, you absolutely can CC your regular email. The reason that I like for you to use your Cougar Mail is that I'm supposed to require that. It's an issue of privacy and it confirms that in fact you are the person that you say you are. If um, let's say your name is Bob Smith and you are bsmith14 at cougarmail.com.edu and I'm corresponding with you, I know that either I'm communicating with Bob Smith or I'm communicating with somebody who has Bob Smith's passwords. But if somebody named Robert Smith at yahoo.com um, emails me, I may assume it's you, Bob Smith, but it may be somebody who's created a fake email and you're not, that person isn't at all Bob Smith. And so if I were to start discussing the fact that you failed the midterm or something like that, I would be sharing information that's confidential. That's why I'm not supposed to use your personal email. But again, you can CC yourself so you have a record of those correspondence. I don't, I'm not trying to mess up your filing system by any means. Okay, so let's talk about email etiquette. This is one of the things that distinguishes a professional from somebody who's just learning. Um, so things to consider. The first thing is your subject line. For correspondence at Colin, when you're dealing with your student, or excuse me, your, your faculty member, you want to have two things on your subject line. The first thing is you want to identify your course. So this one, you can either refer to it as business law, or of course we are BUSI 2301. This particular semester, I only have one section. It's a big section, but only one section of business law. But sometimes I teach, I've taught up to three sections of business laws at some time. And so if, it, if you're having a, an instructor who teaches multiple sections of whatever course you're teaching, you'd want to also include the section number. Um, and then in addition to identifying the course in the subject line, you, may, you will also want to include some information about what your question relates to so that the instructor can identify um, at a very brief glance, the urgency of the issue. Um, so you need to have both things in that subject line. Um, the, one of the, the reasons that you want to include this in the subject line is that the, your instructor may file things based upon courses. I don't happen to do that. But I routinely will get emails from students saying, um, Canvas isn't letting me go into that assignment. Can you help? Well, um, I usually teach seven courses. And especially um, if it, you're not somebody I've met face to face, I may not remember whether Bob is in business law or Bob is in hospitality um, law or whatever. And so now I have to go through all my courses until I find Bob Smith's name. Um, it makes it so much easier if you let me know where, what course you're in. And you may think, well, you know, why do I care about making things easier for you? When you make things easier for me, guess what happens? You get a quicker answer. If you don't give me the course information, I'm going to get it for you eventually. But what I may well do is send you back an email saying, tell me what section you're in. And that, again, is going to delay you getting the information you wanted. Or I may, may say, well, you know, that's going to involve some work for me to research that. I've got other stuff to do. So it may delay you getting your answer for a while until I have the time to do a little bit more digging. 
So if you had instead said, this is my section, I might have been able to give you an answer in minutes. Um, I kind of freak students out sometimes because sometimes I do respond within two or three minutes of them sending an email. Um, and you're going to significantly increase your chances of that if you have a subject line that is effective. And then you're going to want to greet me in a professional way. You're going to want to start with a dear. You're going to have some honorific. Uh, this works. You can spell out professor if you want. Um, you can use Ms. if you would like. I do have a Juris Doctorate, but attorneys prefer not to be called doctor. And so don't refer to me as dear Dr. Gruber. I won't be offended, but it's not the uh, appropriate term for me. So um, professor, prof, or Ms. would be appropriate. My last name and then a colon. The comma in the salutation is appropriate if it's a personal communication, but if it's professional, an academic would be professional, then you're going to want to use the colon, which is one dot on top of another dot. And again, all of the things I'm saying, obviously, if you're corresponding with your busy, with your boss, you're not going to have sec course numbers in it, but you'll, you'll still want to use these same tools to be successful in your business communication. Then you'll want to have um, the body of your email. This is obviously the most tricky part to write. Obviously, you're going to check for typos. You're going to check for grammar problems. I encourage you to read your, your uh, uh, email aloud. When you hear it yourself, um, you will catch the, the missing words, the grammar problems, things like that. Also consider it from the perspective of the recipient. Um, the recipient hasn't been do, dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with, and so you have to kind of unpack, this is what's happening, this is why I need to have this information. It's going to take you a little bit of time to compose that email. And then you'll want to, of course, have some kind of valediction or closing that's appropriate. Uh, usually the way to go is with a sincerely, comma, here you use a comma, you don't use a colon. So sincerely, comma, and then your name. We'll go with Bob Smith. And your contact information. Again, you're going to want to use your Cougar Mail. My piece of advice is don't send emails from smartphones. There's really two problems with that. The first problem is it almost ne they almost never satisfy these requirements. Um, and the second thing is that unless you go back and erase it from your email, um, it communicates to the recipient, hey, this person is dashing this off. They didn't want to invest the time to be careful. I'm not a very big priority to them. The, the quality of my experience isn't important to them. It's a little bit, I don't want to say insulting, that's too strong, but you're certainly communicating something that's not positive to the recipient. So my suggestion would be go ahead and compose it, compose it on a laptop or a PC or even a tablet. If you do decide to send it from a smartphone, go ahead and delete that because, again, that's that sign that tells the world, eh, I couldn't really bother to do this right, but you're not so important to me that I'm going to care one way or the other. These are some things to keep in mind when you're composing your emails. So why should you do all this? Should you do all this because you are an awesome and tremendous person? Well, of course you are. But you want to do it primarily for your own self-interest because when you're sending an email, most of the time you're wanting something from the other person. And so one of your jobs is to motivate the, the recipient to do something, uh, to make a particular decision in your favor or to give you a certain amount of information or whatever it is. And so when you do these things, you are communicating information that the recipient needs, but you're also communicating respect and courtesy. Hey, look at this. I spent some time writing this. You can tell I didn't dash it off in five minutes. I composed something. I thought about it. I read it. I checked it. This is involving some effort on my part. Your recipient is going to see that and say, hey, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to take this seriously because the sender took me seriously. And you're much more likely to get a quick and thorough response under those circumstances. So at the end of the day, it's kind of self-serving on your part. It's a win-win for both parties. Um... We'll talk about this in a few minutes. Ah, here's the breakdown. You'll also find this on the syllabus. This is how grades are calculated. The orientation quiz is worth 1% of your grade. But a little caveat here. You can take the orientation quiz three times 
That's the good news. And your highest grade is what we're going to keep. But the caveat is you have to score a 90 or above. If you score an 89 or below, you get a zero on it. You can continue in the course, but you know, you're going to lose 1%. Orientation quiz is not hard. There is no reason why any of y'all should not have 100 on this. Uh, maybe not 100 on the first time through, but certainly by the second or third, you'll get 100. And if you, you don't, it's because you're not really trying. So put forth a little bit of effort. If you've taken it twice and you just don't seem to be getting the answers right, come and contact me and we'll work through it and see what's happening. To, and we want, I want you to be successful. Let me talk about these four things right here. These, well, well, well uh, these four things, uh, there will be for every chapter, one of these things. There will be a chapter, textbook chapter, there will be a quiz. For each textbook chapter, there will be a learn smart activity. We'll talk more about these later on. For each chapter, there will be one or more assignments. And if there's one assignment, that one assignment will be worth 15 points. If there's more than one assignment, all of the assignments together will be uh, collectively worth uh, 15 points. Um, and then, of course, there will be the discussion board. The, these last three items are Connect tools. So you can see 45% of your grade, uh, you have to access Connect. So if you get 100 on everything else, the highest grade you can have is a 55. Uh, the class participation is not a Connect thing, but I'm going to lump it with Connect for this purpose, and that is you only need to do 10 of each one of these. So um, that means that if you do 10 Connect uh, reading activities, you don't have to do it for the rest of the chapters. If you take 10 uh, chapter quizzes, you're done. You don't have to do any more. If you do Connect assignments, all of the assignments for 10 chapters, then you're good to go. If you participate in 10 discussion boards, you're good to go. Now you may think, well, okay, that's good enough. I would have no reason to do the 11th or the 12th. That's true and not true. It's true in the sense of you don't have to do it. You won't get a zero for not having completed the 11th or the 12th. But there's two reasons why you may want to go ahead and do more than the 10. And in fact, most of the time students do do. Most students complete uh, significantly more than 10 of these. Uh, the first reason that people do more is that these, um, most of the time people aren't going to get 100s on these. You can get, you'll get a 100 on the Learn Smarts, but you're probably not going to get 100 on the assignments or the quizzes. And so I take the 10 best grades. So if let's say you had, um, there's 15 questions on the quizzes. So let's say you had a you know, a 12, 15, uh, 13, um, uh, 10, uh, 12, et cetera, et cetera. And you have 10, let's say these are your, your five highest grades. Well, we'll, we'll, the, we'll say these are typical grades for you. Um, well, if you do the 11th one and you get a 14 on that, then I'm going to get rid of this 10 and put the 14 in its place. So doing more than 10 can help your grade if you score a higher grade on your 11th than you did on at least one of the ones previous. And that's true for all of these activities. Now the Learn Smart, there's really no reason not to get 100% on each one. So this isn't so much true for that. Um, the discussion boards are pretty easy to get all of your points on that as well. But usually you see students wanting to maximize their grade by doing more than 10 on these two activities. The second reason that I encourage you, and students I think usually do find it a good idea to do more than 10, is that these are really good ways to prepare for tests. Um, even though these are Connect tools and I, we, I don't offer tests that Connect has prepared, the material is the material. I mean, there's only so much you can do with it, so um, learning the material through these Connect tools is also very good preparation for the uh, midterm and final examination. The midterm and final examination are pretty significantly more difficult than this stuff. Sometimes students are doing pretty good on this stuff and they think, okay, you know, I don't really have to study too much for the midterm or the final, actually for the midterm, <laughs> and because um, I because I'm doing fine on this stuff. Well, maybe that's true, but I would still encourage you to prepare well because I have seen um, students sometimes who do do pretty well on this stuff and then are disappointed by their grade on the midterm. So those are some things to keep in mind.
So 10 of each one of these. You can do more, but if you do less than 10, you're going to, I'll have to enter zeros for some of those grades. Um, here's an example of things that you'll want to think through. I have this posted in a different place. So I'm not going to go over it here. I have something called a cheat sheet that includes the same information. Okay, let's talk about the midterm a little bit. I already mentioned that it's a, a fairly challenging test, or at least students tell me that it's fairly challenging. It's not challenging in the sense uh, that I would say calculus is challenging. It's challenging in the sense that learning Japanese would be challenging. And by that I mean is it's not necessarily intellectually hard, but there's just a lot to remember. I don't know any Japanese other than, I think, arigato. Uh, but if I were to learn Japanese, I'd have to learn the word for door and pencil and paper and chair and car and peanuts and all the other words um, that are in the Japanese language. And most of those words in Japanese wouldn't look anything like the English equivalent. And so I wouldn't be able to look at the word, or obviously Japanese writing looks different than, than uh, English writing, but um, I wouldn't be able to just kind of puzzle it out like I might be able to do with French or Spanish. Um, I'm just going to have to memorize it. And no matter how smart I am, there's no way I can guess my way into a good grade in the Japanese class unless I've, you know, studied. Some people are better and worse in learning those terms, but everybody's going to have to put in effort. So that has, that requires memorization work. But there's another type of hard, and I call that the calculus kind of hard. I mean, there are things you have to learn to be successful in calculus, but it's much more intellectually difficult stuff, not so much memorization. Some people are better at the memorization part of learning. Some people are better at the skills part of learning. Um, and sometimes it can depend upon what the skill is. Uh, this course fits much more in the memorization area. You're going to learn a ton of stuff about the law. The stuff you learn isn't going to be hard. It is genuinely not challenging stuff, but it's a lot of stuff. And study after study indicates that when you have a lot of stuff to learn, be it Japanese, be it the law, be it something else, you need to pace yourself. Nobody can cram a thousand facts into their heads the night before the test. So if you pace yourself over the course of the semester, say, I really need to learn this chapter this week. And I really need to learn the next chapter the next week and then review the chapter that I've already learned. That's the recipe for success. It doesn't require more studying. It just requires smart studying. In fact, if you plan it out and do it in an individual little bites every day, you're going to find you have to study less overall. You will find the work much more interesting and less dreadful to have to study and you will retain it longer. You'll have to spend less time. So it's a win-win-win. So please, please consider doing that. So we're ready for the midterm. You've prepared well for it, and now you're ready to take it. How do we go about doing that? Well, you can uh, really do one of two things. You can take the midterm at the testing center on the Preston Ridge campus or the Frisco campus. You'll find that testing center on the second floor of Founders Hall on the Frisco campus. It is right above the bookstore. If you choose to take it there, then you will need to bring your college-wide ID. The testing center will not accept a driver's license, so be sure to get your college-wide ID, have it with you. And you will need to check the hours at the testing center. Generally speaking, the testing center has pretty open hours um, Monday through Thursday. Uh, they don't have hours on Friday night. They have hours during the day on Saturday, and they don't have any hours on Sunday. They will not allow you to start taking a test in the last hour that they are open. I believe they usually close at about 9 o'clock Monday through Thursday. But again, check uh, the testing center for the specifics. That's one way you can take the test. That's how probably 90% of students take it. Another path is that you can take it through ProctorU. ProctorU is a proctoring service, and you can actually use this in the privacy of your own home. Now, there's a few caveats I like to mention about this option. One caveat is, is that your computer has to be compatible with ProctorU. It needs to be, you know, I don't want to say state of the arts, but it has to be pretty recent uh, with, with the technological things that are necessary for a proctoring system. Uh, one of the big things it needs is to have a webcam. 
If you have children, you need to have somebody who's going to be available to take care of those children. You'll need to have a quiet place without anybody else being present. So those are some technical things that you'll need to make sure that your uh, setup is going to permit. The other thing is that there is a fee that you'll have to pay for it. The fee is going to turn on how long you are going to be using ProctorU. And so if you're a quick test taker, it'll be less expensive than if you're a lengthy test taker. I think the costs usually vary somewhere between um, $10 and $40. And I think most students kind of come out in maybe the $25 to $30 range. So it's not a trivial expense, but it's also not going to break your, your, your uh, budget. And obviously, if you take it in the uh, Frisco Testing Center, it's free. It's part of your ordinary cost. But uh, some people, uh, maybe who live uh, far away or are going to be out of town at a particular time, find the Proctor U option sensible. So definitely something worthy of your consideration. So let's say you choose to use ProctorU. How do you proceed? Well, the most important thing you need to know about ProctorU is you have to let me know about it at least 10 days before the window opens. And this is true for the final exam and the midterm. Not five, 10 days from the last day that the window is open, but from the the day that the window opens. The reason that we need this time is that you need to do stuff and I need to do stuff to set things up. And so uh, that get, puts us in the, the best place to be successful. And there's some additional things that I, I explained to you that I don't necessarily need to tell everybody uh, who because most of y'all aren't going to be interested in this. So I, I go through a few more of the pros and cons to make sure that you are making the best choice for yourself. Um, and so those are some things to keep in mind. Please go ahead and calendar this on your calendar if you think at all you're going to use ProctorU. And you may, if you're sure you want to use ProctorU or if you're sure you want to explore that option, pause me right now and send me the email right now. And that way you can be certain that you've covered that line. Okay. Sometimes students say, well, I don't really want to use ProctorU, but the Frisco campus is not very convenient for me. Can I take it on the Plano or the McKinney campus? Um, let me tell you what the deal is there. I am delighted if you want to do that. When I submit the test to the Frisco campus, because that's my campus, so that's where I'll be turning it in, I will say, make it available to the other two campuses. And many times it works just that easily. But sometimes it doesn't happen. I don't know why. I don't know if it's the Frisco campus's fault or it's the Plano campus's fault or it's the McKinney campus's fault or who knows what causes the problem. But not infrequently, students will say, Professor Groover, I called up the da, 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 testing center and they didn't have it. Um, if that happens, here are the pieces of advice that I'm going to give you. So I'm going to give it to you now so you'll be prepped. So if for whatever reason it's the last day of the testing period and um, you don't know what to do, here are the things you want to think about. First of all, I would suggest that you ask the testing center to double check. Many times they actually do have it, but maybe they, that particular clerk isn't that familiar with, with, uh, with where these things are stored. And so saying, I'm pretty sure it's there, would you mind double checking? Sometimes that's successful. The second thing that you can do is say, well, would you mind calling the Frisco Testing Center? Because uh, they should have the test, and the professor told us that she was making it available on the campuses so they could resend it to you. Um, I've had students be successful with that approach. If for whatever reason the, the testing center is unwilling to do that or something along those lines, then what you could do is you could call the Frisco Testing Center and you could say, hey, um, I'm here at the Plano Testing Center and um, I'm supposed to take this test and I, I'm, it seems to be missing. Would you be able to refax it? That can be a third approach. If those three approaches don't uh, work, then my advice to you, frankly, at that point would be to head on over to the Frisco Testing Center. I don't have any magic you know, potion I can give to the, uh, the, either one of the testing centers to make them somehow find that document that they don't have. Um, and many times I won't be available. I may be in class or I may be out of town or doing something else and so not reachable. If you've done those first three things and you haven't been successful, you're welcome to reach out to me. But again, if it's the day that you need to take the test, uh, and I'm not available, then I do suggest that you go ahead and plan on going to the Frisco campus at that point. So those are some things to keep in mind when you're considering campuses. You aren't limited to the Frisco campus, but I can only really promise that it'll be at the Frisco campus. Um, so if you're planning on going somewhere else, please call them in advance. 
class participation. You know, when we're in a face-to-face -face class, it's easy for us to have participation. We talk, we do group activities in class. On an online uh, situation, it's a little bit more challenging. And the way I address that is by having discussion boards. And that's tremendously original on my part. I know, right? <laughs> um, it is 5% of your overall grade. And it's both the easiest 5% in the course and the most difficult 5% in the course. It's the easiest in that if you do it, you're going to get five points. You know, it's not hard at all to do, but it does involve remembering to do it, and it does involve some effort. Um, so please go ahead and do that. I say participate every week, but as I noted before, you just have to participate in 10 modules. Uh, performance beyond that, if you've gotten all five points in the first 10 modules, um, you might find it rewarding, but it's not going to affect your grade. So what do you need to know about your discussion board? Well, the first thing is your first post, which I usually call your substantive post, needs to be at least 100 words long. And it needs to include the word count at the end. A couple of ways to do the word count. One is to drop it into something like Microsoft Word and it, you run the word count there. Another is just to count the word count yourself. Um, I'm now going to speak to that half of 1% that isn't you, but just so you'll know, I count the words. And if I come up with 95 and you say it's 100, I'm not going to be happy. That's an academic honesty issue. And so please don't do that. I understand that some people might say, well, I thought that was two, you know, without was actually two separate words. It wasn't a compound word. Sometimes there's an issue about one or two words, but um, if you're off by several counts, that's not a mistake. I mean, it is a mistake, but it's an ethical mistake and not a counting mistake. So um, keep that in mind. Um, if you somehow or another can't manage to get beyond 97 words, um, then just say word count 97. You're going to lose a point, but you're not going to lose your integrity. So keep that in mind. Your reply per post has to be at least two sentences. Um, so uh, that's a pretty easy standard to make. They need to be two complete sentences. It can't be great, awesome job. Those aren't two sentences. A sentence needs to be structured as a traditional sentence. Um, another way of looking at it is you're probably going to want about 40 words in that. You don't actually have to list your word count in your reply post. Your reply post isn't just saying, well, I really liked your, I really liked your substantive post. Thanks for doing that. No, it needs to respond. You can agree, you can disagree, but if you do either, you need to explain why you do. I agree with you because I really found the example that you gave compelling for these reasons. That's what you need to have in your uh, content. As I noted before, each discussion board is going to be open for exactly seven days, um, and you'll need to make your uh, substantive post and your reply post in that time if that's one of the ones you're planning on participating in. Um, that we, we have a discussion board for each chapter, and there's also an introductory discussion board. Uh, that introductory discussion board does count as one of your 10. You will start your post by hitting the reply button. It's a little bit, maybe not the most intuitive. Here are some FAQs. Uh, we don't meet it all in this course. Everything will be on Canvas. Um, you can work ahead. Um, everything that you need other than the discussion boards are available to you right now. Uh, well, you can't take the midterm or the final, but everything other than the midterm and the final and the discussion boards are available. If for some reason the week that we're going to have the midterm or the final examination is a week that you aren't going to be available, you are welcome to do it ahead of time. Just let me know and I will make it available to you at that time. You can always work before. Let me talk for a second about um, uh, how I make tests available for the midterm and the final. For the midterm, I usually have it available for seven days, and I always include a Saturday in that. For the final, it's not always able to be seven days, but it's usually at least five days, and I also include a Saturday in that. So you have a lot of days to take the test. 
As a result, I encourage you to take the test early on the first or second day. That way, if something unexpected comes up in your life, you're good. You don't have to worry about it. Let's say I've made the window open for seven days. You're planning on taking it on the seventh day, but you're in a car accident on the sixth day. You're in the hospital. You can't possibly take the test. Um, you've got a doctor's note saying you can't take it. You might think to yourself, well, I'll just give that to Professor Gruber. You can give it to me, but I'm not going to excuse it because you were available for five days before when the test uh, window was open. So if you are uh, unavailable for one or two or three or four days or whatever, um, but you're available for one or more of those days, I'm not going to permit you to make do the makeup. Now, of course, if you are in the car accident the day before the window opens and you've been in the hospital all that time, of course, I'll let you uh, do the makeup at that time. So the takeaway is take your tests early. Um, computers. Obviously, there's a lot of computer stuff we're going to do in this course. Uh, all the quizzes are going to be on computers, the assignments, the Learn Smart activities, um, the uh, 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 videos are all in computers and so if you uh, don't have a computer or some other have some other a computer related issue you don't have to use any of your own personal resources because your tuition gets you access to the computer lab you will need your student ID to access it and when you're going to listen to the uh, lectures you'll need to have earbuds or headphones with that you'll need to bring those but other than that you're good to go so don't feel like if you have some problems maybe your internet service isn't very reliable where you live no worries just come to the computer lab um, most of the work that we do in this class will be automatically you'll, be, you'll get your grades back if you want to go over why a particular uh, answer was a certain way or you want to discuss what what uh, uh, why the, uh, a particular topic or something like that I encourage you to do that I would be delighted to talk with you about that just come to my office hours or we'll talk about or call me during my office hours and we can figure out a time or uh, that we can go over all the stuff that you would like to talk about and we can also do that for your performance on tests too um, here we go. Here's some guidance about technical issues. I would encourage you to print out slide 37. Uh, this will give you an overview of some common problems that come up. And of course, if you're having problems getting into Canvas, you can't get into Canvas to get this PowerPoint. So uh, you kind of need to have this available. Alternatively, you can you know, uh, save it to your uh, computer and so have it available. I, let me start off by saying I'm not a computer person. Um, I know a fair amount about Canvas since I deal with it every day, but um, I am not the most uh, conversant, so other people could probably give you better pieces of advice. Also, the um, eLearning Center um, has more expertise, and they also have greater powers as being the administrator, uh, so they can fix things that I'm not able to fix. So here are some thoughts, though, some things to think about. Um, sometimes, problems will arise and I am the cause of them. I forgot to turn something on or I put the wrong due date in. I am very, very fallible and I apologize in advance if and when I make those errors because I probably will. Um, so obviously if, if you think I'm the cause, please contact me as soon as possible. Be diplomatic, send me one of those lovely, lovely emails um, and I will be glad to work on it to fix it. Um, if it's not me, or you thought it was me, but it ended up not being me, try a different browser. Um, if uh, you haven't been using Firefox, try Firefox. If you have a PC, try Google Chrome. These are the two that are probably the best um, for um, uh, Canvas. If your computer is just not working, you may want to try a different computer. And again, you have access to that computer lab. Sometimes asking somebody else just to look at what you're seeing, it may uh, be staring you at the face what you need to do and yet you still can't see it. Um, so that can be a good strategy. And then finally, of course, contacting the ELC. Another thing is, is just to restart your computer. Uh, log out and then go back in or just turn off your computer and restart it. Those are some other suggestions.
I'm really looking forward to a great semester. I know that we'll have a wonderful time in this course. Please, please come and see me if you have questions. So this is the end of the PowerPoint, but it's not the end of this presentation. I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about a few other things. So we're back to our Canvas. I'm going to show you some tools here that may be of benefit. This is that PowerPoint I just went through, and here is the syllabus for the course. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. actually already have it open down here so I'm just going to go over here to this a lot of stuff in the syllabus isn't maybe directly useful this is the the last day you can withdraw from the course without getting a permission of a dean so you might want to calendar this this is the same date for any 16 week course I definitely hope you don't drop this course um, I want you to stay in the course if it, if it at all makes sense to you, but sometimes things happen, and so this is a useful day for you to know about. Here's some technical information. Again, if you're having problems, you may want to look this over in more detail. Um, here are my office hours for the semester. Um, oops. Let's look at these for a second. I have face-to-face -face office hours um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 3.20 in my office. Again, that's in the library building. Um, so if you're around for those times, please do come by. I recognize, though, that many people who are in an online environment um, might uh, not be on campus a lot. And so I have offer Zoom office hours as well, and those are on Thursday mornings. Um, I have information about how to access the Zoom a virtual office a scenario uh, down here. You can see you can access from a PC, from a Mac, from an iPhone, or from an Android phone. Right here, the way to do it. Let's see, here we go. Here we go. As you just hit that space bar, uh, control click, and it will take you into Canvas. I'm not going to go ahead and open that up. This is actually the tool that I use to tape lectures. It's very, very easy to get into it, but if you do encounter a difficulty, just send me an email or call me if it's during my office hours. Um, and then if these times don't work for you, of course, we can always schedule another time to, to meet, and that would be a good way, to, again, to reach out for me then would be via email. Again, we already talked about my email. And then here's my office number. Now, again, the, the best time to use this is during my office hours, my face-to-face -face office hours. I'm not in my office a lot. I work mainly from home. I've got kids, and it's easier for me from that perspective. So if you want to reach me, this is by far the quickest way. It's the way that I prefer. And so I would ask that you focus on that. Here's information about the textbook. I won't talk about that anymore, but this is a good place to get the specifics. Here's that same information about what matters in the course. Here's information about the orientation quiz, which we've already talked about, and the discussion board participation. I'm going to take a moment and go through Learn Smart Activities, Assignments, and Quizzes. Now, I don't have the ability to go into Connect in quite the same way you do. So what I'm going to do right now is go into Connect the back way. <laughs> um, so you won't be entering this way. The way you'll be entering is, let me just show you. You'll be going down, let's say you want to go into, um, this quiz. You'll just click on this button here and it'll take you in. But that's not the way I can do it. I have to do it behind the scenes. So I'm going to go into, I'll go, go into this particular module. Oops, wait a second. I'm gonna have to Okay, so I'll just pick one randomly. And I'm going to go into the Learn Smart activity. 
The Learn Smart activity is um, really what made me want to use Connect. It has a lot of science to support it. It's an interactive learning approach. One of the things that science has taught us about learning is that we learn best when we are challenged with the material. Passive learning, simply reading and reviewing notes is not very effective and moving information from short-term memory to long-term memory. But when we are challenged to use the information, um, that's when we're, our brains are designed to transfer it from short-term to long-term memory. And that's what uh, Connect us. I'm sorry, yeah, well, Learn Smart does. One of the neat things about Learn Smart is that everybody gets 100 on it. When you miss a question, that's not a big deal because Learn Smart will tell you what the right answer is and then later on it will ask you that same question. Well, now you know the answer. And so you will continue to see that question again and again until you get it right. The only way that you won't get 100 is if you don't do it or you stop in the middle until you've reached completion. So here's the chapter. I said before that all the chapters that we're doing are available to you. And so here's an example, chapter 21. You can see uh, the pages are a little bit grayed here. I'm going to go down to the bottom and advance. And you'll see, ah, there are some pages that are a little bit more black here and that have some highlight. You may, by the way, want to use what the, uh, the Learn Smart activity tells you are the main ideas in terms of highlighting, you may want to actually highlight your own book if you choose to do so. So this is the stuff you ought to focus on at first. Read the stuff that is highlighted and that is in black. And once you make progress in that, then you're going to want to go over here to practice. You hit this button, then you'll get a series of questions. And there's two aspects to each question. The first one is you uh, decide what you think the answer is. A blank proprietorship is a business in which one person is control of the management and profits. That's a sole proprietorship. Um, let's say you're certain of that, the answer, so I'm going to pick I know it. Oh, look, I was right. Okay. Now it's going to ask me another question. This one I'm going to intentionally miss. If you started doing business without thinking about the form, you would be a, I'm going to say, incorporator. I'll click on this, and then I'm going to say, I'm unsure. Yep, I was unsure. I should have said sole proprietor. Now I know what the answer is. They're not going to give me this question right away, but not too distant future this question is going to come up. If I'm not sure I can remember this, I'd probably write it down so I could then refer to it when that question comes up again. Usually the Learn Smart activity should take you about 20 to 30 minutes to complete for each chapter. At any point you can flip back to read and do some more. And as you make progress in the textbook, um, you more of the pages will turn from gray to black. So it's a progressive thing. So that's how Learn Smart works. So again, you should be able to get 100% on all the Learn Smart activities. Um, but when we get to the quizzes, it's a different, or excuse me, when we get to the assignments, it's a different uh, situation. You have all the time that you want to do the assignments, but if you choose the wrong answer, you're not getting the point. Um, again, each uh, module is going to have 15 points for each assignment. Um, but sometimes it'll be in one assignment, like here in Chapter 2, there is one assignment worth 15 points, but sometimes it'll be many assignments. We'll look at chapter seven. We actually have one, two, three, four, five, six. We have six assignments. If we add up all these points, one, four, two, two, four, two, they add up to 15. Um, so there's a difference there between how you do that. Um, the, the final, and the, these assignments, some of them are videos, some of them are drag and drops. There's a variety of different style of video. Let's look at the quiz format is our last one that we'll, uh, focus on. I'm going to go back here. Let's look at a quiz. I'll give you a one free quiz answer here. I'm going to go into quiz and I'm going to preview. We're going to see the answer to at least one quiz question. Here we go. Blank refers to which party gets to what each party gets in exchange for his or her promise under a contract. And the correct answer is consideration. Now, obviously, when you're doing the test, 
there won't be a green arrow here. You'll have to pick between these four. And if you were to pick something other than consideration, you won't, wouldn't get that point. Um, and it wouldn't tell you right away, well, you picked a legal object, you should have picked consideration. This is a quiz, you know, so um, you have 15, excuse me, 10 minutes to do it. Um, the questions are a multiple choice and true false. Yes, it's the combination. And so um, you can easily do it in the 15, in the 10 minutes, but there's not going to be extra time. Um, I do that because I want to keep the integrity of the test, of the quiz real. If I gave you unlimited amount of time, uh, you wouldn't do this, but somebody else in the class might be tempted to look in their textbook or to Google the answer. And so by providing only 10 minutes for the 15 questions, I'm reducing the likelihood of people being able to do that very many times. Some students, though, are kind of freaked out by having only 10 minutes to answer 15 questions. That can be a source of a lot of anxiety, and that is not my goal at all. I happen to be the type of person who likes to be very careful with my test questions when I take tests. And so if you fall into that category, congratulations, that's a good way to be. I, I admire that, I applaud that. Um, the way to take the, the test so that you have unlimited time is just to let me know, and I will put uh, the same exact test questions in the testing center on the Preston Ridge campus for you. And you can take those tests um, at your leisure. You can sit down and do all 10 or however many you want to do at one sit sitting if you would like to. If you decide you're going to take the test at the testing center though, you can't then take them also online. Um, I will uh, not permit that. I won't know when you actually took the test at the testing center, so I can't just take the test you, you completed first. There won't be a record along those lines. So you would need to communicate with me. You might say something like this. Well, I've already taken chapters one, two, and six online, and going forward, I want to take the rest of my quizzes in the testing center. That's fine, but you can't then go back and change your mind later on. If you take them in the testing center, um, there obviously won't be any availability that you would have to look at notes or things along those lines, so your uh, time would not be restricted. Uh, most students choose to take the tests online. I have seen that students who choose to take the test in the testing center don't usually improve their performance. So I think the 10 minute thing is more of a psychological issue versus actual performance. Most people are gonna be able to adequately answer the questions at the time. But if you would like to do that, I certainly am happy to oblige you. I have all the tests ready, so it's not a problem for me. Okay, so those are how those particular uh, testing things work. We've already talked about the midterm and the final. We already talked about ProctorU. We've already talked about emails. Here's a, another summary about um, emails. This is one thing we haven't talked about, so let me refresh on this one. Um, sometimes the problem with emails are the structure of it. There's typos, there's um, a poorly drafted subject, there's not a good salutation. There's just something wrong with the way the email is structured. That's one category of problem. But there's another problem that is perhaps as common, and that is that people use emails for the wrong purpose. Um, emails are tremendously useful. I use them all the time. Um, but they don't do everything okay. I mean, what tool? does accomplish everything. I mean, there are certain things you cook in the microwave and certain things you cook in the oven and certain things you cook in the popcorn popper. Uh, and they all have their uses and their benefits, but you're not going to use them interchangeably. And so email is great at what it's great at and it's pretty awful at what it's not great at. And one of the things that some of the students try to force emails to do is to do more than they can. Emails are great when the recipient is being asked to uh, answer a question in three sentences or less. Another way of looking at this is what I call the five minute rule. Can the recipient uh, respond to the question in five minutes or less? If the, or, or three sentences or less. If the answer is yes, it's probably good for email. If the answer is no, then it probably means you need to actually have a conversation. 
or a face-to-face -face meeting sometimes. Now you can still use email to schedule that meeting, but it's not going to work for um, resolving the issue. What you're going to end up doing is you're going to get frustrated and it's going to be a back and forth. It's going to take a long time. It's going to end up taking you much more of your time and much more of my time than what might have been a five minute telephone conversation. I promise you I'm not scared to talk to him on the phone. We'll have a lovely time. Um, so an example of a question that isn't good for email would be, I'm just not understanding jurisdiction. Can you explain that to me? Well, if the textbook and my lecture on jurisdiction weren't adequate, is my email going to do it? Now, if you had a particular question like, um, uh, this is what I think NREM is. Is this right? NREM jurisdiction. That might be a good email. I think I've got it. This is what I think it is. Am I right or am I confusing it with quasi in rem? And, and that might lend itself to a good question, especially if you're correct. If you're not correct, it might not. It might be, uh, let's talk about this in some more detail. Another common misuse of Canvas is when a student has forgotten something that we covered in the orientation. Um, and so she might email me saying, I can't remember, do I have to participate in 10 discussion boards or 12? And I will say, uh, thank you for your email. Um, that's something I cover in the orientation. Uh, if you would like some help going through the orientation, please feel free to stop by my office hours. Um, here they are, blah, blah, blah. blah. I'm not going to give you information that's already in the orientation materials. Um, that's honestly not setting yourself up, setting you up for success because you're the adult. You're the one who's responsible for this. I've given the information and so uh, you're better served if you uh, kind of own that experience. This class is really your opportunity to be successful. I'm giving you the materials, the information, and you are going to turn that into a, a, a great success. And I am here to help you if you're struggling, but I'm not here to spoon feed you because it's easier for me to give it to you than for you to look it up yourself. And so um, if you can't find it, awesome. We'll talk over the phone. I will, we'll, I'll show you how to go through the screen, show you all the different places that you'd find the information. I am glad to do that. I will be very, very nice to you. It will be a lovely experience, but I'm not going to do that legwork for you, again, because you're an adult, and it's honestly not a very respectful thing for me to do for you, because I would be basically saying, you're not, I'm, I'm going to be treating you as if you weren't an adult. Okay. Um, here is the calendar. I already have all the due dates in the actual modules, but um, I have this also listed here. Um, so you can see week two, we do chapters two and six. You may want to flag that on your calendar because that's obviously going to be a busy week. Another busy week is going to be week seven. Um, and that might be our last double week. Yeah, I guess it is. Okay. So let's see if there's anything else I need to talk about. Ah, oh, let me scroll down here to the end. Just a couple more things to talk about. Quizlet. Quizlet is um, a really awesome tool for this course, but it's also so useful in other courses. I'm just going to show you uh, how Quizlet works. I'm going to click on this Quizlet button here. Uh, Quizlet, by the way, is a service that is free. Um, they will want you to pay for it, but there's no reason to pay for it. There's other uh, businesses that do something like Quizlet. Um, so uh, this is uh, one thing to think about. Um, when I teach this course face-to-face, -face, I offer not I offer multiple tests, so this test one doesn't really apply to us um, because we only have a midterm and a final. But for the constitutional principles chapter, I think that's chapter five, here we have um, 40 terms. Now students prepared these so I did not um, uh, vet them necessarily uh, but for the most part you're going to find them to be very accurate. If you come across one that doesn't seem to be correct please let me know and I'll be glad to, to review it and see if it's correct. You can do the flashcards 
Um, you can uh, do a lot, there's a couple of game-like things. The one that I like or I recommend the most is to do the test feature. And what I suggest you do is hit test and then go down here to options and set up your test so it's multiple choice and true false. And because uh, this is the way my tests are, They're my tests are multiple choice and true false. So this gives you a very good prediction of the type of test questions you'll have. And you can go through this and you'll see what your performance is. And you know, if you get a high grade, then that probably means you're well prepared for the final. If you don't have a high grade, uh, then you may want to spend a little bit more time. Let me go back. You can prepare your own Quizlet. Uh, this textbook, the Kubasek textbook, is really popular, and so you can probably find um, on the Quizlet website. Let me just go to it for a second so you can see. Quizlet.com. You can, um, I'm just going to go ahead and search Kubasek Dynamic. Um, here is one chapter. Here's a um, here, oh, this looks like a really awesome one. It has 285 terms from um, business law. Uh, this isn't from our particular course, um, so they may have covered somewhat different chapters. So you'd probably want to look at these. Let's say when you looked at this, you found that, you know, 80% of it is what you need, but some of them aren't. What you can do is you can download this into your own account and then take out the ones that aren't relevant. So those are some things to think about um, in terms of maneuvering through Quizlet. I also have a, a, a PowerPoint um, available here for your review. Um, and I have um, materials about contracts that can be helpful for that prep. And I have information about the final exam right here it gives you a breakdown of the questions and I know I have a breakdown of the midterm I'm not seeing it here right now but I, I give a breakdown um, definitions are a big part of um, the class and so please focus on those as you go through uh, your preparation for tests. At this point I think we're done. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been uh, a great start or I hope it's been a great start for you in this semester. I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you well. Please please come and see me when you have questions. I look forward to getting uh, to know you and working with you over the course of this semester. Thanks so much for your attention and have a great day.